Hades is mythology's warden of death. He commands the vast and frightening realm that all mortals, good and bad, must enter when they die. It is his job to make sure they never escape. He is the god of the dead, and none of us want to die. He is to be feared. His power is awesome. The Greeks wanted nothing to do with Hades, because to know him is to be dead. The Greeks tended not to depict or represent Hades. There are not temples built to him. He's someone that is kept at arm's length, like a kind of uncle whose business you're not sure about and don't want to talk about too much. The main idea is that for the ancient Greeks, to be dead is not a very good thing. The myth of Hades was created to make sense of what happens after we die. Hades is the ancient Greek god of the underworld, a dark lord who controls all dead souls. But he wasn't always so menacing. In the palace of the gods, a baby's cries pierce the silence. A newborn son. His name is Hades. His father is Cronus, the king of Greece's ruling gods, the Titans. Cronus was told in a prophecy that one of his children would murder him, and he is determined to make sure that doesn't happen. The father fears being replaced by the son. That's human psychology. Cronus' solution to the problem was eat your kids. In one swift motion, Cronus consumes his newborn son. Infanticide wasn't really common in ancient Greece. So the idea of a father actually deliberately trying to kill his children uh, would have been very shocking to them. Now, of course, since they're immortal, the children that Kronos swallows are not dead. They are just locked away inside of his belly. Hades and most of his siblings grow up inside their father's stomach. But one child was able to escape Kronos's wrath. His name is Zeus. He returns as a grown god and frees his trapped brothers and sisters. The siblings now unite to form the Olympians and seize control of the universe from their parents in a final clash with the Titans. After the overthrow of the Titans, the Olympians have the job of trying to figure out now who does what in this new order. Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus. The three male Olympians agree to divide the spoils of conquest. Hades is the oldest child, and according to the real Greek law of the time, that gives him an advantage. Throughout most of the Greek world, the law of primogeniture was the practice, which means the oldest born, who should be Hades, should have by right inherited the largest share. But Zeus, the youngest brother has his own ambitions to rule the world. It is a clash between Zeus's ambition and Hades' birthright. The brothers decide to draw lots. Whoever wins the heavens will become the king of the gods. In ancient Greek custom, the drawing of lots was a typical procedure used to divide things up that were otherwise very difficult to discern. And everybody would have recognized that the drawing of lots was a legitimate way to make a tough call like this. The gods draw. Poseidon claims the seas. Zeus claims the heavens thus becoming mythology's supreme commander. 
and Hades draws the short straw. He is left with the land of the dead. This was not something he chose for himself. It was fated him, he did it, but it bent him in some ways. It made him not a happy god. It is a tragic turning point for Hades. He could have ruled the universe. Instead, he is condemned to the realm of the dead. In ancient Greece, the attitude towards uh, death was not um, so different to our feelings today towards death. So people would not worship Hades as much as they did Poseidon and, and Zeus. Hades' new home is dark, bleak, and filled with the sadness of dead souls. Ancient texts describe it as a dank expanse of caves and rivers. It is a place that is dark and gloomy. Its rivers are full of mist. It has the stench of decay. It's a very forbidding place. It's a place where if you go, you do not come back from. According to the myth, dead souls enter a vast and gloomy underworld, a realm named after its master, Hades. It is the ancient Greek equivalent of heaven, hell, and limbo, all under one roof. We, in a Christian context, think that what happens to you after death has to do with what you've done here on Earth. If you've been a good person, then you go to heaven. If you've been a bad person, you go to hell. For the Greeks, actually, those places were all located in one place. They were all the underworld. It's the one place we can't ever see. We can make up stories about what might be going on there, the great punishments that are occurring or the terrible things that might be happening, but we never know, and so we continue to wonder. In the myth, there are three levels of Hades. Most of the dead descend to the fields of Asphodel, the dreary resting place of the nameless masses. The fate of the average person in the underworld is just to have to wander around a gray shade and live a not very uh, exciting or interesting life. It's a kind of sad place to be. It was sort of like the, the Catholic conception of limbo, a sort of twilight place, uh, quiet and peaceful, but full of mourning trees, where the soul would simply wander aimlessly. And then there is the place reserved for those who've most offended the gods. A vast abyss, 40,000 miles deep. A dungeon of suffering and eternal torment, surrounded by a flaming river. This is Tartarus. The souls of very bad people would be sent to Tartarus, which is quite like our, the Christian conception of hell. In fact, Tartarus was so closely linked with hell by the early Christians that it was even mentioned in the New Testament. And it appears in a verbal form in 2 Peter, um, having to do with people being thrown into Tartarus. And then there were a few who were terribly uh, wicked who were punished in Tartarus. And that, I think, is the origin of what Christians know as hell. For the fortunate few, Paradise awaits in the third realm of Hades, the islands of the blessed, the ancient Greek equivalent of heaven. Everything grows by itself, and you can eat your fill with no work. There is absolutely no work. Uh, there is constant rejoicing. There are round dances. There are streams, and there is pure friendship. That was where famous and glorious people would spend the rest of their lives. <laughs>